All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, before we getting started, uh, let me briefly introduce our valuable guest, uh, Bibi Huang. Uh, Bibi is a final year PhD candidate at CMU. We are joining UCSD as an assistant professor. In the fall of 2022, her research interests are mainly in three aspects. Automatic causal discovery in complex environments with theoretical guarantees and advancing machine learning from the uh, causal perspective and using or adapting causal discovery approaches to solve scientific problem. Her research contributions have been published in GMLR, SML, NeurIPS, KDD, uh, EEI, EGK, and UEI. Her successfully lead a NeurIPS 20 workshop on causal discovery and causality inspired machine learning and co-organized the first conference on causal learning and reasoning Claire 2022. She is named a rising star of the trust worthy ML initiative and a recipient of the presidential fellowship at, at CMU in 2017 and a Apple scholars in e and ML PhD fellowship in 2021. Uh, let us uh, sincerely welcome uh, Dr. Huang uh, to give as a talk at the TransML YSS seminars. Hi, Dr. Huang, please proceed. Yeah, thank you so much, Xinfeng, for the invitation and introduction. Uh, my talk today is on learning, uh, learning and using causal knowledge, a first step towards a higher level intelligence. This talk will contain two parts. Our first issue, how we can learn causal relationships from observational data. And furthermore, I will show how causal understanding can help further advance machine learning and AI. First, you may concern about the motivation, why we are interested in the study of causality. Many tasks in, in science and engineering require causal information. Specifically, causality helps for understanding mechanisms and processes. For instance, in your science, it is essential to find out the information flow of different brain areas in order to explore our brain functions and therefore to provide better treatments for some disorders. And causality also helps for policy making. For instance, the politicians want to know if they set the policy of keeping social distance, whether it will be useful to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And in AI, to achieve general purpose AI, one challenge is to move beyond association and domain specific pattern recognition towards the discovery of the underlying causal relations that can produce patterns across general scenarios of interest. And moreover, causality also helps for control, for fault de detection, and for counterfactual reasoning. Now you may have another question. How can we find the causal relationships So before answering the question of how to find causality, first of all, I'd like to point out the difference between causality and association. We say two variables X and Y are associated if and only if they are dependent. And causality is often defined in terms of intervention, denoted by the do operator. We say X is a cause of Y if and only if setting X to different values will change the probability of Y. And we usually use graphical representations for causal relations, where the nodes represent uh, random variables and the directed age from X1 to X2 means that X1 is the direct cause of X2 relative to the given variable set. We all know that association doesn't imply causality. So a traditional way of finding causal relationships is by doing randomized control trials. For instance, to examine whether a vaccine is effective for COVID-19, the subjects are randomly split into two groups. One is the treatment group, which gets the vaccine. And the other is a control group, which actually gets placebo. The vaccine is effective if and only if the injection of the vaccine causes a reduced infection rate in the treatment group. 
However, in many important settings, randomized experiments could be impossible, for example, in astronomy, or infeasible when there are too many variables, or unethical, for example, when investigating the living human brain connectivities. Then, alternatively, can we find causal relationships by analyzing observational data under appropriate assumptions and constraints? Because observational data are much easier to obtain. In this talk, I will show that under appropriate assumptions, we can find causality from observational data even when there are existing unobserved confounders. And the problem is usually is known as causal discovery. Also, I'd like to mention that it is different from the problem of identifying causal effect given the causal graph, which is usually based on the potential outcome framework or the dual calculus framework. In this talk, I will focus on identifying the causal graph. The organization of the talk will be as follows. I will first show classical approaches in learning causal relationships from observational data. Then I will introduce recent developments in causal discovery from non-stationary or heterogeneous data and causal discovery for learning linear latent variable causal graphs. Then in the second part, I will show how to leverage causality to better understand the tasks in machine learning and AI. In particular, I will take transfer reinforcement learning as an example. In causal discovery from observational data, a crucial step is, to, is how to relate the causal structure to the statistical properties of the data. Very excitingly, researchers have found that under appropriate assumptions, we can draw a connection between the causal structure and the statistical independence. Here, this notation means that given X, Y, and Z are conditionally independent. And here, the edge with arrow represents the causal arrow and the age without arrow represents the causal skeleton. Specifically, with a causal Markov condition, we can infer statistical independence from structure separation, and the causal Markov condition holds in general. And moreover, with the faithfulness assumption, we can infer structure separation from statistical independence. So with a connection between causal structure and statistical independence, we can now make use of conditional independence constraints to infer the causal structure. One of the most well-known algorithms along this line is the PC algorithm. The PC algorithm works when the underlying data is ID, the underlying structure is acyclic, and there are no latent confounders. PC mainly contains two steps. In step one, it identifies the causal skeleton by testing for the conditional independence relationships. Two variables are adjacent if and only if they are dependent conditional on any subset of their adjacent variables. And in step two, it orients the causal directions by further making use of the results from conditional independence test. But notice that with this type of method, the causal skeleton is usually identifiable, but some directions may be not, such as the causal direction between x1 and x5, and that between x3 and x5. So we must extract some kind of asymmetry in order to identify the causal direction between every pair of variables. Now let's go one step further. Extract asymmetry by leveraging the independent noise condition. We assume each variable satisfies a functional causal model. That is, the effect of y is a function of its cost x and the noise term e, where the noise term represents unobserved factors that influence y. And the cost is x is independent of e, which is a property of the causal system when there are no latent confounders. Now let's see a simple illustration of the asymmetry. We assume Y is linearly generated from X with a non-Gaussian noise E. And in this example, we use uniform distribution for E. So in order to see the asymmetry, 
we fit a regression model both in the causal direction and in the reverse direction, and they compare the independence between the predictor and the, the estimated residual in the two directions. The red dots here are the scatter plot of the predictor and the, the estimated residual. We can see that if we fit the regression model in the causal direction, the independence holds, but it doesn't hold in the reverse direction. So you can see we find asymmetry to determine the causal direction. Then for the previous example, we can make use of such asymmetric independence to identify the causal direction that is undetermined with conditional independence tests. tests. But we should notice that in a linear system, the asymmetry relies on the non-Gaussian noise. If the data is jointly Gaussian, then we don't have such asymmetry. Moreover, if there are no restrictions on the functional class of F, then we also don't have, uh, don't have such asymmetry. Another way is to use the independent change between causal modules to identify the causal structure. If we factorize the joint distribution in the causal direction, then the derived distribution modules, that is the distribution of the cause and the distribution of the effect given its cause change independently, which means interventions that change one module will not affect other modules. But such, independ such independence, but such independent change generally doesn't hold in the reverse direction. So this asymmetry can be used for determining the causal structure as well. We usually call a distribution module a causal module if it is derived by factorizing the joint distribution according to the causal structure. That is, the causal module refers to a conditional distribution of a variable given its direct causes. For example, in this structure, the causal module of X3 is a, is a conditional distribution of X3 given its direct causes x1 and x2. And we call the property that the cause modules are irrelevant, irrelevant to each other, the modularity property. You will hear the terms cause module and the modularity throughout the presentation. Usually, this asymmetry is more general, but it is usually very hard to characterize in practice. Later, we will see how to characterize such independence in a statistical way when there are distribution shifts. Now we have a rough idea about the basic criteria and approaches for causal discovery. In the last few decades, several solid approaches in causal discovery have been developed. However, previous approaches to causal discovery usually rely on heavy assumptions. For example, they are designed for ID or stationary data. And some approaches assume that the causal relations are linear and assume that there are no latent confounders or selection bias, or only allow very restricted confounders. But the problem is that in many complex problems, these assumptions may not hold and they are even not testable. And this is one of the most, most challenging problems in causal discovery. So one, so one aspect of causality-related research is on developing causal discovery approaches that rely on weaker assumptions. For example, how to do causal discovery in the presence of distribution shifts, latent confounders, or selection bias, and, from, and even from non-identical variable sets. In the following, I will focus on two projects in causal discovery. First, I will dis introduce causal discovery from non-stationary or heterogeneous data. In many cases, the recorded data could be non-stationary, where the data distribution changes over time, or be heterogeneous, where the data distribution changes across domains or conditions. For example, in FMI data, the data distribution may change along with the, the attention or the outside stimulus. And such stimulus may act as hidden confounders that influence a large part of brain areas. And moreover, when we concatenate data from different subjects for analysis, it's usually the case that the genetic factors that influence the measured variables 
vary across subjects, leading to varying data distributions across subjects as well. However, usually the genetic data are not available, and directly ignoring such hidden confounders may give us misleading results, including spurious, uh, spurious connections or wrong causal directions. So to address this problem, we developed a principled framework as well as practical method for cost discovery from, non, from heterogeneous or non-stationary data, and we use CD0 for short. CD0 allows that the heterogeneity is caused by unobserved change factors, such as the GC and the theta C in this example, whose values change across domains or change smoothly over time and are not observed. So given the observational data with distribution shifts, CD0 answers the following three questions. First, how can we detect variables with changing modules and recover, recover the causal skeleton? Second, how can we identify causal directions by making use of the information carried by distribution shifts? And furthermore, after identifying the causal stru structure, we would like to visualize how the causal mechanisms or causal modules are changing across, uh, across the different domains or over time. The basic idea of CD0 is that we represent the hidden change factors as functions of C, where C can be the domain index, time index, condition index, and so on. C acts as, acts as a surrogate variable to characterize the latent change factors. In a previous, previous example, the causal relationships among brain areas may be confounded by smoothly changing attention or outside stimulus. So here, C can be the time index to characterize the change of attention. Moreover, when concatenating data from different subjects, the causal relationships may be confounded by genetic factors, which vary across subjects. So in this case, C can be the subject index to remove the influence from the hidden genetic factors. So we incorporate the variable C into the causal system as a surrogate to characterize the unobserved change factors. And then we can make use of the kernel-based conditional independent test to test for the conditional independence relationships and together with efficient procedure such as the PC algorithm for causal discovery. Now let's go through the search procedure with this example. And for a simple illustration here, we only consider instantaneous causal relations and it's easy to extend it to consider both time delayed and instantaneous relations. Specifically, regarding the search, we start from a fully connected graph over V and C and assume that the latent change factors are confounders. So the direction is from C to V. Then we detect the changing causal modules by testing for the conditional independence between VI and C. For example, here we find that V3 and C are conditionally independent given V2. Then we can remove the age between V3 and C. Therefore, VI has a changing causal module if and only if it, has, it is adjacent to C. This step is very useful in anomaly detection and the root cause analysis, because in some real world problems, although one may observe a huge amount of variables with changing joint distributions, actually it is only due to a few root causes which have direct connections with C. This step has been applied to Apple production line to, effic to efficiently detect root causes of some mere functions in order to quickly fix and currently, we are extending it and going to apply it to genetic data to understand the root gene, root gene mutations that are responsible for cancer. Next, we recover the causal skeleton for the conditional independence by further testing for the conditional independence between every pair of observed variables uh, with an efficient search manner. There's an age between VR and VJ if they are dependent given any subset of their adjacent variables, including C. And furthermore, we can identify which variables are influenced by the same change factors. 
Theoretically, we can show that given C, the causal system can be correctly discovered asymptotically as if the hidden chain factors were known. After learning the causal skeleton, we orient the causal directions by the independent change principle. That is, the distribution of the cause and the distribution of the effect given its cause change independently. But, but such independence is generally violated in wrong directions. And the invariance case, well, only one of the adjacent variables connecting with C is a spatial case. Specifically, we develop a kernel embedding of changing conditional distributions to represent the changing causal modules. And accordingly, propose a statistical dependence measure between conditional distributions to estimate, as to estimate the dependence between, causal, between distribution modules, and then therefore to determine causal directions in a non-parametrical way without window segmentation. And with this procedure, we can identify all the causal directions between uh, in this example. Notice that if we naively ignore the distribution change in this case and directly apply a uh, traditional causal discovery methods for ID data, we will conclude that with spurious age between V2 and V4 and have wrong causal directions. On the other hand, if the data is ID with general functional class of the causal mechanism, then we cannot identify any causal direction in this structure. So we're happy to say that distribution shifts actually provide extra information for causal direction determination. And intuitively speaking, it is because heterogeneity can be regarded as a consequence of soft intervention done by nature. After determining the, the causal structure, we can now learn a low dimensional representation to visualize how the causal module changes over time or across different domains. So overall, CD North enjoys the nice properties that it can handle causal discovery from distribution shifted data. Uh, and actually distribution shifts help for causal discovery. And the CD North allows particular types of hidden confounders. Moreover, CD0 doesn't have hard restrictions on the data distribution and on how the causal module changes. And it works for both linear and nonlinear cost relations, and for, bo uh, for both instantaneous and time lagged cost relations. Also, CD0 can be easily adapted to different kinds of search procedure. Moreover, currently, we are extending CD0 to handle cyclic graphs as well as the existence of selection bias. So we apply CD0 to several uh, real-world data sets, including the task, task FMI data. Uh, this data set contains three states, one resting state and the two, task, uh, two task states. This figure, the top figure with red line, shows how the state of input stimuli changes over time. And the left figure shows the recovered instantaneous causal relations over 25 brain regions. Well, the red, 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 cy red cycles mean that the corresponding brain areas have, have changing causal modules across different states. We find that homotopic connectivities are robust. Also, the regions that are responsible for visual input processing and language processing have large degree centrality. Moreover, the identified training cost modules correspond to the key areas for visual and language perception. And these findings are consistent with the background knowledge. We further visualize how the cost modules of several brain regions change across different states. Interestingly, we find that the resting state, we find that there are obvious changes between the resting state and the task state which are matched by the shaded area. And the changes between the two task states are relatively small. Now let's go to the second project in causal discovery, learning linear latent variable causal graphs. Currently, existing methods in causal discovery usually focus 
uh, cost relations between the observed variables. But in many scenarios, the observed ones may not be the underlying cost variables, but are generated by latent cost variables or confounders that are causally related. In the following, I will focus on cost of discovery in such a case with linear cost relationships and non Gaussian wise terms. For instance, here, X are the observed variables, and the L are the hidden confounders that cause X. And there are causal relationships among the latent variables here. So given, only the, so given only the observed variables X, we answer the following two questions. First, how can we locate the latent variables? Or in other words, cluster the clustering the observed variables. And second, how can we identify the causal structure among the latent variables? To answer the two questions, I will first introduce a new condition, generalized, generalized independent noise condition, and we use GIM for short. And I will convey the main idea from this example. Suppose Y and Z are two sets of observed variables. If we can find non zero combinations of Y variables that is independent from Z, then we say Z and Y follow the gene condition. With the gene condition, although we only use the measured variables X, it turns out we can find a uniform way to analyze both latent variables and measured variables. This is mainly because we can draw a connection between the gene condition and the graphical properties of the variables. Roughly speaking, D and Y follows the gene condition if and only if there is an extraneous set of the parents of Y that blocks all passes between Y and Z. For example, uh, here, L1 and L2 block all passes between Y and Z. And they are also the parents of Y. So in this case, Z and Y satisfy the gene condition. So with the connection between the gene condition and the, the graphical structure, we can now identify the latent variable graph by testing for the gene condition over the measured variables X without using any other information in a two-step search procedure. In the first step, we find the causal clusters that is locate the latent variables by testing for the gene condition over X. For example, we find that when testing for X5 and X6, the gene condition holds. So we can infer that X5 and X6 are in the same cluster and the dimension of their latent parents is Y. So we add a one dimensional latent variable L3 at the latent parents of X5 and X6. Similarly, we can infer other causal clusters. Then after identifying the causal, causal clusters, in the second step, we can identify the causal structure of the, of the latent variables by further using the gene condition. For instance, we find that when the Y set contains variables from cluster one and cluster three, and the Z set contains variables from cluster three, then the gene condition holds. So we can infer that the causal direction is from cluster three to cluster one. Overall, the gene-based approach works for latent variable graph with linear cost relations and non-Gaussian wise terms. And for each latent variable with size k, it, require zero, it, it requires at least two k children. And moreover, it allows that for each measured variable, there can be multiple hidden parents. Currently, we're extending it to cover both Gaussian and non-Gaussian data and that allows hierarchical latent causal structure, where the children of latent variables may still be latent. At the same time, we are also relaxing the number of children for structure identifiability. And moreover, we are going to extend it to allow nonlinear causal relations and allow the input to be high dimensional images, which is related to causal representation learning. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, then I will continue. 
now uh, we have seen some methodological developments in causal discovery. One of the main goals in this field is to develop methods that rely on weaker assumptions. The next topic is how causality helps better understand and advance machine learning and AI. Over the last decade, there have been dramatic progresses in the field of machine learning. However, the successes are usually, uh, usually share several similarities. For example, they usually need a huge number of training data, and they are usually for fixed tasks, but hard to generalize and adapt to new environments. So besides deep feature learning, we may need some other regularizations or knowledge constraints, such as causal constraints, in order to achieve more reasonable AI. So first and foremost, I'd like to choose some properties of causal models that will be helpful in, in machine learning tasks. First, with the causal graph, as well as the quantitative models, it's obvious to see how different variables are interacting with each other. And for a target variable, we can know which factors influence it and can be used to control it, and which factors help to predict it. Moreover, with the causal structure, we can directly perform Bayesian inference on it. Another very important property is modularity. Given the causal graph, we can factorize the joint distribution into causal modules. Basically, modularity says that causal modules are independent of each other. If we change in the causal module of V2, the causal modules of other variables will not be affected. So with the modularity property, each causal module can be considered separately. And the modularity is often called disentanglement. But notice that currently for disentanglement, most literature uh, only consider marginal independence without considering the causal relationships among them. The third property is that given the causal model, we can not only do prediction using association, but also predict on the interventions and uh, do counterfactual reasoning, which has been called the three layer causal hierarchy. Specifically, prediction invokes purely statistical relationships about seeing what is. For example, would Jake's headache be killed if we find that he took aspirin? An intervention involves changing what we see. For instance, would Jack's headache be killed if we make sure he takes aspirin? And counterfactual reasoning involves imagination and retrospection. For instance, would Jack's headache be killed had he not taken aspirin, given that he took aspirin and recovered? It can answer questions like, what if I had taken a different action? And moreover, counterfactual can also help to uh, can also help help in credit assignment and data augmentation, which avoids real and possibly risky explorations. So, besides cost of discovery, another which, uh, research focus is on advancing machine learning tasks from a causal perspective, including focusing in non-stationary environments, reinforcement learning, mechanism-based clustering and classification domain adaptation, representation learning, and so on. Uh, next, I will take transfer reinforcement learning as an example to show how the graphical representations and the modularity property can help quickly transforming to new environments. The task of reinforcement learning is to learn policies that maximize the reward function by interacting with the world. It can be applied to many scenarios. For example, in self-driving uh, self cars, the goal is to learn a policy to operate the car so that the car can safely arrive at the destination on time. And for sequential treatment in healthcare, the goal is to learn a policy to decide the next treatment based on the laboratory tests of the patient so that the patient can recover well. One practical challenge of reinforcement learning is how to make quick and sample efficient adaptations of the learner policy when faced with new environments, since the real world is always changing. 
We propose the LRL that adapts efficiently to changes across domains by locating a minimal sufficient set of factors that are essential for policy transferring and understanding how the factors are changing across different environments. For instance, for the cut pole game that aims to balance the pole by putting force on the cart to move it left or right. When we move this system from the Earth to the Mars, if the agent can characterize that, it is the gravity that changes the policy and understand how it affects the policy, then the agent can quickly adapt the policy by estimating the one-dimensional gravity with only a few samples. It is more efficient as well as, well as interpretable compared to directly transforming, transforming the observed high dimensional images. Now let's see in detail how graphical representations and the modularity property help the task of transfer reinforcement learning. Suppose we have data from points, including high dimensional image sequences, actions, and the rewards and the different domains may have different environments with, with the changes, for example, with the changes in the gravity and the corrupted white noise level. The basic idea of LRL is that we leverage a parsimonious graphical representation to characterize the structural relationships among variables in the system, including the structures of a different dimension of states S, the reward variable R, the action variable A, and the perceived images O. Oh. Moreover, unlike classical methods that learn the distribution shifts over the high dimension input, thanks to the graphical factorization, we introduced a low dimensional vector theta to characterize the domain specific information in a compact way. In particular, theta O is used to characterize the changes in the observation function. Theta S is for the change of transition dynamics and the theta r is for the change of the reward function. In this example, the domains are differ in gravities and the corrupted white noise. So we can use the two dimensional vector to characterize the change. Well, one dimension is for the gravity and the other dimension is for the different noise levels. And notice that here, we only, uh, we only observe image sequences of OT, R, uh, the reward R and the action A. All other parts are estimated from data, including the latent states S, the transition dynamics, the change factors theta, and uh, the structural relationships among the variables. So we can see that graphical representations provide us a compact way to encode what and where the changes are. Specifically, from the graph structure, we can know which state dimensions are necessary for action prediction. In this example, only S1 and S3 are needed for policy optimization, but not S2, because it doesn't influence the future world. And moreover, we can know where the changes are and then know which changes should be adapted. In this example, only the gravity change captured by theta S and the possible reward changes captured by theta R need to adapt. But we don't need to adapt the white noise captured by theta O because it doesn't affect the future reward. In addition, with the property of modularity, each factor can be considered separately, which avoids the cost of dimensionality. So by explicitly leveraging this compact representation to encode the changes, the policy, how to balance the pole, only changes with gravity in this example. So in a new domain, only a few samples are needed to estimate the, to estimate the low dimensional change factors. And then we can directly drive the optimal policy in the new domain. We can see that the graph knowledge provides us more interpretable and efficient adaptation. Moreover, by identifying will and how the changes are, we not only make use of the environment part, but also the variant. So it enables us more effective adaptation. And uh, I would like to also mention that only relying on the environment part may sacrifice performance 
because critical information may be missed. Also, uh, I'd like to mention that the basic idea of ad IR can be applied to other tasks as well, such as domain adaptation and forecasting in non-stationary environments. Overall, ad IR works for changing uh, ad IR works for changes across domains in reinforcement learning tasks. And recently, we have also extended it to cover non-stationary environments, including smooth and abrupt changes. Moreover, currently, we extend it to cover the changing ac action space and state space as well. We apply the proposed ad IR algorithm to Atari and Pong games, where the agent controls a pedal moving up and down, aiming at hitting the ball. We consider the changes across different uh, changes across different. Uh, we consider the change across different environments, including the change of orientation, the image size, the color, the noise level, and as well as different reward functions. And this table shows the average score and the one standard deviation over thirty trials, where the score is the number of steps in playing the game before failure the higher, the better. We compared our ADRL algorithm with other state-of-the-art methods. And we can, from, we can see from the table that ADRL will always give the best non-oracle results. And in most cases, the improvements are significant, indicated by the black dot. Finally, let me summarize several key points in this talk. So we have seen that with appropriate constraints, we can find causal relationships from observational data. Particularly, we find that different types of independence help in causal discovery, including conditional independence, generalized independent noise, and the independent causal modules. Moreover, we find that distribution shifts and the higher order statistics help for causal causal help for causal structure identification, even for those among the latent variables. We further see how causality can help to better understand and advance machine learning and AI tasks. In particular, we find that the graphical representations and the modularity property provide us a compact description of the joint distribution as well as the changes. And furthermore, with the causal model, we can do prediction on the interventions and do counterfactual reasoning. Thank, uh, this is our group and at CMU. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much uh, for Dr. Huang's great talk. Uh, hi, audience. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, yeah, there are some questions in the chat box. Okay, can you see? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, Do you great. know any work on identifying wrongly invert cost in a 99% cost graph. For example, a given cost graph with 99 correct cost directions and 1% wrong directions. Can we find those wrong ones in the literature thing? Mm. So basically you mean that uh, you are sure about, you are sure that 99% graph uh, cost directions are correct and only 1% are wrong. Oh, sorry, I cannot hear you. Uh, I, I, I'm wondering that if we have a almost correct causal graph and there is some mistake inside, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering yeah. if there is any literature or work studying identifying those wrongly, those wrong causal directions, so that we can improve the we can improve the correctness of the, the entire graph. Thanks. I see, I see. Thank you for the question. Uh, I, I don't think I know any literature on this specific problem, but um, one way I can imagine is that we, uh, you may use the current methods for cost direction identification to test the, uh, to test the causal directions and to see whether you can find the, the causal directions that is different from the one you have now. I see. So basically, a, a very 
simple starting point is that applying the, the existing identification tools to see there is yeah. any mismatch. Yeah, I see. exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. No worries. Okay. Uh, I have a, a little bit general questions. Uh, there, there, there recently there was a debate that the causality can solve everything. For example, especially for the trustworthy issues like the transparency, uh, yeah. privacy, and interoperability, and even the robustness, security things. Uh, the, uh, there is a debate that causality can solve it. Another viewpoint of view is uh, it's just a deep learning has another has encountered another bottleneck will be tackled very soon in the maybe in the future. So the deep learning approaches kind of make breakthrough. So kind of like their debate, ongoing debate. I just wondering what's your viewpoint uh, in this regard? Uh, how do you think about this kind of debate? Yeah. So from uh, my view as a person working on causality, so I think there are uh, at least that, that cause can help us to better understand some underlying uh, properties of the system. And with such understanding, we can like we can it can uh, achieve better like better interpretability um, and better as well as better uh, robustness um, to um, in machine learning problems. Um, I'm not sure like uh, do you mean that in in, in deep learning? Uh, the, so they can, yeah. I mean, another since in quality, another direction is to involve a uh, cause of understanding to machine learning tasks. So we also try to um, uh, try to involve cause of understanding to machine learning tasks and in deep learning. So I'm not sure, like uh, when they say uh, deep learning can um, achieve the goal, do do they uh, try to add something, add something new in deep learning, or just just use uh, adding more layers. Mm. Yeah, I see. All right. Uh, th thank you very much for your sharing. Yeah, thank you. yeah. Excuse uh, me. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, uh, may I have a following question? Yep. Yeah. Sure. Um, so given given Jin Feng's question, this makes me uh this inspired me a question that um the arise of the study of causality is that we we human currently know that uh, statistical uh, correlation and association is not enough for for us to teach the machine so that the causality is 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 of importance to to have better understanding and research so maybe we can ask that Besides statistics and causality, do you know do you know anything missing, which uh, which is missing missing and critical for, uh, on the on on the path toward general AI? Yeah, do you, do you want to guess what is is there any missing topics that we need to study? Otherwise, it would suggest that just combining statistical statistics and uh, causality, we we can achieve general AI. Yeah, I think this is a very broad question. <laughs> yeah, it's a very big question. <laughs> uh, so for me, um, yeah, I, I don't have a good answer to it. I, I yeah, so. I see, I see. But I think this is a very interesting question to ask. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely it's a very interesting question. I probably can lead the lead a new direction for uh for the machine learning research. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh if there are no further questions coming up, let's let us thanks again for Dr. Huang giving us a very great talk. Uh thank you very much. Uh now this is the end of our today's seminar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.